Okay, everybody, we're going to get started in a minute. So I just wanted to welcome all of you tonight to the Center for Jewish History, one week after our snowstorm. So I'm happy to see all of you who are able to come this week. I'm Judy Greenspan, the Director of Public Programs, and this is the second program in our new series, Very Short Introductions, Short Talks on Big Subjects. Can I see a show of hands? Is, has anybody been here? Was anybody here for our first program? Oh, wow. Oh, this is good. No, no, no. The first very short introductions. All right. So if you were here in January, or if the name of the series sounds familiar, then I would suspect you're already acquainted with the very short introduction books published by Oxford University Press. How many people here have already read a very short introduction book? Okay. So our series is produced in partnership with Oxford and includes four programs this year, each one featuring a talk by an author of one of these slim, informative volumes. In a moment, Nancy Toff, Oxford's American editor of the VSI series, will say a few words about these short books, of which there are currently 560 and many more coming. You are holding number 217, and we're very pleased that Dr. Eric H. Klein, the author of Biblical Archaeology, a very short introduction, is here tonight, along with Kristen Romey, the archaeology editor and a writer for National Geographic magazine. Dr. Klein brought years of experience to the task of writing this 133-page book. He's a professor of classics and anthropology, and the current director of the Capitol Archaeological Institute at George Washington University in Washington, DC. He's been an active field archaeologist for more than 30 seasons and is the author or co-author of 18 books, including number 365 on your list, The Trojan War, A Very Short Introduction. Dr. Klein, whose numerous credentials are more completely listed in your program, was also unusually young when he discovered his life's work. When I was seven years old, he explains in his recent book, Three Stones Make a Wall, my mother gave me a book called The Walls of Windy Troy. It was about Heinrich Schliemann, did I pronounce that right? Schliemann, and his search for the ruins of ancient Troy written just for children. After reading it, I announced that I was going to be an archeologist. That was the first of many books about archaeology that Eric read growing up, and he says, the stories of finding lost cities in the jungle and uncovering ancient civilizations were mesmerizing. In college, I declared my major in archaeology just as soon as I could, and when I graduated, my mother again gave me the book about Schliemann that had started it all 14 years earlier. I still have it in my office at George Washington University today. Kristen Romey was a little older than seven when she too became intrigued with this fascinating field. As she tells it, she was a somewhat frustrated classics major at Vassar when an archaeologist came looking for volunteers to excavate a Caesarea in Israel. Kristen quite literally dove into the field. She got her diving certification and worked in Herod's Harbor for two excavation seasons before going on for a graduate degree in underwater archaeology. I didn't know there was such a thing. I don't know if any of you do. I think that's unbelievable. A fellow of the Explorers Club, she's worked everywhere from Yucatan to Yemen. And her work, at, among the stories she's written for National Geographic, was a, a recent December cover story on the archaeology of Jesus. She covered the recently discovered Isaiah seal and the only Philistine cemetery yet discovered, and it was discovered in Ashkelon, also in Israel. So finally, a few words about where we are tonight. Not unlike an archaeological site, the Center for Jewish History is also a place to unearth treasures from the past. This remarkable institution is a world-renowned center for scholarly research and academic conferences, a destination for public programs, concerts, exhibits, and genealogy research, and home to five partner organizations, the American Jewish Historical Society, the American Sephardic Federation, the Leo Beck Institute, Yeshiva University Museum, and the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research. 
Together, our five partners possess the world's largest and most comprehensive archive of the modern Jewish experience outside of Israel. This includes, just to give you an idea, five miles of archival materials in five, different lang five dozen languages and covering 500 years of history. We have some 50,000 digitized photographs, 500,000 books, and thousands of artworks, ritual objects, recordings, and films. Our librarians and archivists are available in our reading room to help access these materials, and we urge you to come back and dig through our resources. Now, you all have pencils and a note card, so just a word about that. As the program is going along, please jot down any questions that you will have for Kristen, Kristen and Eric. And I will collect these cards just before the Q&A portion of the program. Afterwards, I hope you'll join us for a reception and a book signing in the Great Hall, and we will hopefully see you there. So, Kristen and Eric will begin in just a minute, but first, Nancy Toff of Oxford University Press. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome back to those of you who are here for uh, the second time, and uh, I hope uh, you will forgive me for repeating some information, but for the newcomers, uh, I just want to give you a little background on the history of the series uh, and where it has uh, come from and where it is going. Uh, the series began life in the 1990s as a series of paperbacks called Past Masters, which was edited by Sir Keith Thomas at the University of Oxford. And these were surveys of the thought and writing of leading philosophers, political figures, uh, scientists, uh, Aristotle, Darwin, uh, people like that. And then in 1995, the UK uh, office of Oxford uh, decided to rebrand the series as the Very Short Introductions, which we call VSIs. And we began to expand the title list to include concepts and fields of knowledge, as well as people. We now have three editors working on the series, acquiring new books, one who does only science, and one UK and one US editor acquiring everything else. So this is the perfect job for somebody like me, who grew up loving Curious George, uh, and reading uh, from one encyclopedia article to the other in a shiny new set of world books. So the child who grew up asking, why is the sky blue, turned into the curious adult who asks, can somebody please tell me what postmodernism is, or why are Mormons so interested in genealogy? So to plan the VSI series, I put on my Diderot hat, and I tried to think about how to organize all knowledge into these nice little intellectual packages, VSIs. And of course, every time we think we have this title list nailed, somebody comes along with another good idea. So we welcome suggestions from our readers, uh, from our authors, from our audience here. I'm happy to hear from you by email or any other means. Uh, we've gotten some great ideas, the Habsburg Empire, apartheid. Um, we have rejected a few. Um, in the past week, we got one for the walking stick. Um, and we thought maybe that wasn't the best choice, um, along with Olivia Newton-John, so we have a separate folder for those. Uh, but mostly we go out and we commission um, these VSIs from academics who have the right combination of expertise, literary flair, and enthusiasm for their subject. So I get to think about who I would like to have as my personal tutor on any particular topic, whether it's Zionism or populism or the Trojan War or ethnomusicology. And can they do it in 35,000 words? So in the case of biblical archeology, span the choice of author was quite easy. My longtime author, Eric Klein, uh, professor of classics, archeology span and history at George Washington University. <coughs> About 15 years ago, uh, Amanda Padani, who is a professor of history at Cal Poly uh, Pomona in California, uh, recruited Eric to write the volume on ancient Egypt in our middle school ancient history series, which I was then acquiring. Uh, when I started uh, work on that series, I was the prototypical tabula rasa. 
I had not studied ancient history since the fourth grade, which was a few years earlier than that. So Eric and Amanda uh, not only educated me, but got me truly fascinated by ancient history and archaeology. And so I was really thrilled when Eric accepted my invitation to write VSIs both on biblical archaeology and on the Trojan War, and Amanda took on the ancient Near East. So as I do with all VSI authors, I encouraged Eric not only to convey information, but to write the book in a manner that tells the reader what excites him about his field. Now, there's always a great deal of back and forth uh, dealing with peer review, which sometimes seems endless, uh, and with various editorial matters. And at one point, Eric was a little impatient with me. Uh, I hadn't gotten my comments back, and I wrote him back, and I said, Eric, if you were a puppy, I would say down boy. Uh, <laughs> but you're not, uh, so please wait until the Bible's editor and I have had a chance to go over the manuscript carefully. And Eric wrote back and he said, okay, I'll chill, woof. <laughs> However, I can't wait to get back into the field and crawl into my little sand pit, blissfully excavating while ignoring the outside world for a few weeks. See, I do keep these things in the archives. So that enthusiasm clearly comes through in his book and it will surely come through tonight as he talks with Kristen about this fascinating topic of biblical archeology. span so here is the very erudite Eric Klein for a very short introduction to a very deep subject. Okay, well, thank you, Nancy, and thank you everyone for coming this evening. Uh, I have to tell you that I was lucky enough that Eric and I took the train up from DC this afternoon and we talked nonstop. <laughs> And one of the things we were talking about was with this book, you said it was one of the shortest books you've ever written and one of the most difficult. Do you want to explain to us why that was? Sure, yes. Um, before I start though, thank you everyone for inviting me. Thank you Judy, thank you Nancy, thank you Kristen for agreeing to be up here. Thank you all for coming out, especially since we were supposed to be last week and now we're this week. So anyway, it's wonderful to, to actually be here and to talk about this. But one thing that Nancy did not mention when I wrote this book for her, she actually made me write it three times. <laughs> so it may be the shortest one I've ever written and it comes in at 35,000 words, not one more. I wrote it three times, so that's what, a hundred and, well over a hundred thousand, yes. Right, so I wrote the first one and she, I sent it to her and um, waited and she got the comments back and she said, well, it's okay, but redo it. And while, <laughs> while you're at it, take out the F word. <laughs> and I said, what? There's no F word in there. She said, it's all over the place. And I'm like, no, it's not. She said, our F word is famous. <laughs> take out famous. So I wrote it again without the word famous, and apparently without the word very, which I had in 126 times in the first edition. So I don't think you'll find many varies in there. So I sent back the second one, and she sent it back and said, you're getting there. <laughs> one more time. And so I wrote that one three times. So, I, But I think I learned, I mean, Nancy is one of the best editors I've ever had, because when I did the Trojan War, she took the very first one. And there's no famous in that one at all. Yes. So yes, so it was very, very short and very difficult. And there was, I can't remember who said it once, but somebody said I would have written less, but I didn't have enough time. <laughs> so same sort of thing. Trying to cram an entire field like biblical archeology span into 35,000 words uh, is no easy task. And I know, in fact, I can see some of you in the audience who are biblical archeologists and hi, <laughs> we've dug together some of you and We've studied in the classroom, some of you, you know this is a huge topic. So what do you pick? What do you, I mean, I wanted to do the top 10 sites, the top 10 finds, the top, and that was when Nancy said, no, we don't do top 10. So we decided to split this into a history of the field and then how does it impact on the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, and, and that was tough. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that really goes to show the complexity of this specialty. You know, I, I cover archaeology around the world, and nothing is as difficult in so many ways as biblical archaeology. Just even the term 
biblical archaeology, what is biblical archaeology, and what is the purpose and the motivation of biblical archaeology? And I think maybe we could start there. What is it, and what, it, what are we trying to get out of it? Okay, so it's a good place to start because that's what I start the book with, right? You have to have a definition before you get started. And it's actually a matter of defining what biblical archaeology is and actually what it is not. Because we're not out to prove the Bible. We're not out to disprove the Bible. We're basically doing archaeology. It just happens to be in the countries that are the lands of the Bible and that are from those time periods. So, you know, we could be digging in Mycenaean Greece and people would you know, care, but they wouldn't care like they do where there's a religious text involved. So it's, it's a tough call, but we're not out to try and disprove Abraham or the Exodus or anything like that, even though that's what we are asked all the time, right? Uh, especially with Passover coming up, for example, right? We've got um, the whole question of the Exodus. Did it actually happen? And that's where when I go to Seder on Friday and Saturday night, I will come home with my shins black and blue. I'm not kidding, they will be black and blue. Why, you ask? Because my wife will have been kicking me under the table the whole time. She's like, don't say it didn't happen. I said, but it might not have happened. She's like, don't say that. <laughs> I'm like, well, Israel Finkelstein tells his family afterward it might not have happened, but he celebrates it. She's like, so do that with us too, please. Just keep your mouth shut for Friday and Saturday night. I'm like, all right, all right, all right. So trying to prove things, uh, you know, so we're not out to prove the Exodus, but that's what we're always asked. Mm -hmm. So especially when we're talking about biblical archaeology, like the time periods that we're beginning in, you're looking at the origins in, in a sense of who are these people who are coming in and eventually creating this, you know, collection of stories and texts and historical accounts that eventually become the book. And we've got big players like David and Solomon. Right, so we've got David and Solomon, we've got Moses, we've got Abraham, I mean, you name it, we've got them. Right, except we don't, that's the problem. Right, so like Abraham, in fact, you guys, National Geographic published a cover article on Abraham, and I was interviewed for that, I'm in one of the captions, and I said, it was one of my more famous quotes, I said, there's no sign that says Abraham slept here. <laughs> Which there aren't, but if you go on the internet and search for me, you will see me called Satan Spawn and various other things. For having said that, I'm like, but there isn't anything. So trying to find Abraham, I mean, you try and find somebody that's 4,000 years old. It's kind of hard, right? But nevertheless, you know, we know about that time period. We know about the patriarchs. We know there are movements around the Near East at that time. You know, it, yes, it could have happened. Can we find Abraham itself? Well, not yet. Same thing with David and Solomon. You know, it, there's a good bet that they did exist, but trying to find them is really, really difficult. And in fact, if you had asked me before 1990, is there any evidence for David or Solomon, I would have said, no, there isn't, because there wasn't. And then in 1992 and 1993, at Tel Dan, way up north, they found uh, the inscription that mentions Beit David. Now, it dates from about 100 years, 150 years after David. It's about 842 BCE. But it mentions the house of David, at least if that's what you interpret Beit David to mean. There were others, the biblical minimalists, the ones that don't believe anything. And they said, well, you know, Beit David could also mean the house of the kettle. It could also mean the house of the uncle. And I'm like, um, no. They're talking about the kings of Judah and the kings of Israel. In this context, Beit David is not the house of the kettle. It's the house of David. So that was our first instance that David you know, existed or probably existed. But Solomon, still looking for him. We actually got absolutely nothing. So I was digging at Megiddo for 20 years, 10 seasons, and again, I see people in the audience from Megiddo. Um, we were never able to find Solomon there. I mean, the Bible says that he built up Megiddo, but point me to one thing that for sure he did, it's kind of hard to see. Now, so that's why, uh, and again, I get asked this at cocktail parties all the time, my answer, if somebody says, you know, have, do we have any evidence for Solomon, my answer is, not yet which I think makes everybody happy. Because it's true, we haven't found it, but that doesn't mean we won't. So, and if we've got Beit David, then probably by default we've got Solomon too. But that's the beauty of archeology. span You never know what you're gonna find. And if you go out looking for something, well, that's probably the first case towards disaster. Do not go out looking for a particular thing. Go out and you find what you find. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, 
the field of biblical archaeology is particularly susceptible to accusations of personal agendas, right? Because when you're digging in Bronze Age Greece, if you find something that disrupts the idea of Mycenaean history, you're not going to personally have an adverse effect on p potentially on somebody's belief system if they're, oh gosh, this king did not live. But once you get into David, Solomon, you know, the temples, and so there are always people who will accuse people of having specific agendas or personal beliefs that influence um, working in the field of Near Eastern archaeology. And how, how do you see that? Like being there smack in the middle of it, your colleagues, you're working with a whole variety of archaeologists and scholars that are coming from all very different backgrounds. And how do they resolve their personal beliefs with their professional actions? That's an excellent question. It, of course, it's, it depends on the person, right? From person to person it changes. But on the digs that I've been on, and I guess I, my first dig actually was back in Israel in 1980. And then when I came back 94 onward, I was at Megiddo. So <laughs> when you're on a dig, everybody comes from all walks of life. And not everybody's an academic. I mean, you've got a lot of people checking off the bucket list, doctors, lawyers, you, you name it. But you've also got, as we said at one point at Megiddo, we said we have every religion known to humans. All right, that might have been a bit of, bit of an exaggeration, but we had, um, gosh, evan we had evangelicals, we had fundamentalists, we had agnostics, we had atheists, we had Jews, Christians, Muslims, Hindus, we had absolutely everybody. And that's what made actually eating lunch and dinner and all that was so interesting because we were all chatting with each, with each other. But upon occasion would come up the question of how do you keep your faith on one hand and deal with archaeology on the other? Because especially if you're from um, a faith that holds the Bible to be uh, inerrant, that every word is true, then you may have a problem. And some of my Seventh-day Adventist friends have a problem with that. So people like Randy Yunker, who teaches at Andrews University, they have the seven rules they made up in order to keep their faith and their um, career separate, basically. So it can be tough, it can be hard. Okay, can you talk a little bit about those seven rules? Well, yes, because um, the seven rules are things like don't push the evidence beyond what it will support, which of course just cause makes sense. Um, uh, other things basically don't go out looking for something in particular. Right, whenever somebody says, oh, I'm gonna go out and find the Ark of the Covenant, oh, that's a path to, re to disaster, right? So things like that. But basically, they're scientific rules um, that allow them to live with it. And uh, it comes down to also, if there is something that maybe conflicts with your faith, find a way to resolve it, find a way to deal with it. Um, and a lot of people, I mean, I know quite a few people that have kind of changed their beliefs as a result of what they've studied and all that, so. Uh, but it really, it depends. Me, I was lucky because I did not grow up particularly religious. So, but I did grow up in a family that questioned everything. And for me, uh, you know, using the Bible is, I use it as another ancient source. I mean, yes, it's more religious than, say, the Neo-Assyrian texts, but it is another ancient historical source. So I tend to use it that way. So, and like you said, that can create a problem with somebody that maybe if they were digging in Greece and they were using Homer, that doesn't usually create problems at the dinner table for using Homer. But questioning the Bible can be problematic. So in fact, this semester, I'm teaching history of ancient Israel. Uh, in, I've got a, about 50, 55 students in there. And then I've got another seminar with 19 students on Jerusalem through the ages. And in both cases, I came in and I said, I have to just tell you right now that we're gonna be um, not questioning the Bible, but we're going to be discussing the Bible in every class. And if that's going to create a problem for you, then this is probably not the right class. But, I mean, this is what you do like every Saturday morning in Torah study or whatever. You discuss the Bible. And so this is what we do. So just yesterday, what's today, Wednesday? Yeah, yesterday, uh, we were talking in class about uh, the death of Josiah in 609, which is right by Megiddo. So it was near and dear to my heart. And what I did is I put up a couple of different texts on the screen and I said, look, we've got an account in Kings, we've got an account in Chronicles, we've got an account in Estrus, and we've got Josephus. And they each tell us that Josiah is killed at Megiddo, but each of them has a different story about how he died. And I said, which one's correct? 
I mean, three of the four are biblical, so which one's correct, right? And so we tried to figure that out. So this is kind of what it's like to be in the field as well, that you have, it's almost like you're watching a traffic accident and you have different um, versions from each of the people that are watching. And archeology span is one of those sources. So yeah, so this is what we deal with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, what's fascinating about it is when you're coming from different perspectives very often, Archaeology is the leveler because you're looking at tra you're looking at very decidedly unsexy things in that sense. You're looking at trade systems, right? You're looking at food supplies. You're looking at armaments, fortifications, bigger systems rather than single individuals. Yes, and I have to say, like I think I'm like most archaeologists. I did not get into biblical archaeology to do biblical archaeology. Um, I started out working on Mycenae and Greece, but I was interested in international trade and relations during the late Bronze Age, time of the Trojan War, time of the Exodus. And as I was looking at what was coming in from Canaan and Egypt and Anatolia and elsewhere into Greece, I'm like, I suddenly went, wait, why am, I, why am I digging in Greece? Why aren't I digging over where these things came from? And I also, uh, after years, said, I want to dig at a site that people have heard of because I had spent most of my career digging at little tiny sites that nobody had ever heard of. And I want, I said, for once, I want to be able to come home and somebody said, where were you this summer? And I said, oh, I was digging at, and name a site they had heard of. So <laughs> um, back in early 90s, my wife came up, um, she, and she had been down at the uh, Archaeological Institute of America meetings uh, with me, and she came up with a pamphlet, and she said, I think I found the dig you're looking for. And she said, I said, does it fit what I want, a place that people have heard of? She said, well, if you think people have heard of Armageddon, then it probably does qualify. <laughs> and that's how I started at Megiddo was because I wanted to dig to start at. But I didn't go over there to dig the Bible. And in fact, you know, late Bronze Age, it's, well, you know, it's before David and Solomon, but it's right in there with Moses and after Abraham. So it does qualify. But... Since 2005, we've been digging at Tel Cabri, which is a Canaanite site, you know, 1800 BCE, somewhere in there. But I don't know, is Canaanite biblical or not? So, yeah, so I'm digging in the region of the Bible lands, let's put it that way. So, and I think that's fairly typical for many. Mm -hmm. I, th I think we run into it not only on the, on the, um, the, the sides of, you know, the per your personal perspectives. We, from the archaeological side, we see it from the media side as well, you know, where... You know, I get people coming to me saying, you know, let's talk about Noah's Ark, let's talk about Exodus, let's talk about David and Solomon, evidence for the first temple, and not these bigger systems that actually inform those, what are decidedly smaller elements in that big archaeology picture, right. you know? And so I know, you know, what the TV audience wants to hear about, mm -hmm. but in, in what, in what the TV audience wants you to find. But what do archaeologists working in this subject area right now, what, what are the big things that need, to, some of the big questions that need to be answered, some of the big finds that, it, things that could solve a lot of issues? That would issues. solve everything? <laughs> right, right. Well, okay, so to take that apart a bit. So this is what I tried to do in the very short introduction, was introduce people to the topic from the beginning of the field to the end of the field and all that. Um, and some of the big finds that we've made already, though I didn't call them famous. Right. Um, but one of the things that I didn't really talk about is exactly what you just asked, like where are we going, what do we need to find? I talked about things that we would use in the future, but in terms of big questions, well, people have been moving away from big questions to a certain extent, or at least in the way they answer them. We've been going to microarchaeology, for one thing, where we're looking at the little things under microscopes uh, in the soil and all that. Um, but it's in order to answer questions that are almost more basic in a way. Forget about the kings, forget about the wars, forget about all that. How did the people live? What did they eat? What did they wear? What did they fear? What did they believe in? And these are things that are actually really difficult to find out from archaeology, unless they've left you the texts in which case it's usually pretty clear what they're doing. But otherwise, I mean, th and this is what, for instance, they're doing at Megiddo now is this microarchaeology is looking at stuff under the, literally under the microscope. 
But we still have some big questions out there. I mean, I personally, I wouldn't mind if we find evidence for Solomon at some point. You know, that, that would be nice. I'm not waiting for it, but we'll see. Um, but most of the finds are unexpected, I would say. And that's the beauty of archaeology. I mean, you, you literally never know what you're going to find. Whenever I was at Megiddo, and I would come up at 5 AM, and I would walk over the tell before we started digging, I was always wondering, what is underneath my feet? What am I walking over now? If I stopped right here and started digging, what would I find? Uh, I never did stop, of course, because I had to get to where we actually were digging. But again, that's the beauty of archaeology. You never know what you're going to find. I mean, just look at the last couple of days. Right? They just announced finding a bunch of year four coins from the first Jewish revolt. Right, Elat Matar just found them in Jerusalem. Um, we've got the Isaiah uh, seal that, that you wrote about. Um, we've got a number of things that had you asked me last month what I thought we would be finding, I would never have mentioned those. It wouldn't have occurred to me to mention them. So while I know the things that we are aiming towards, I also can't predict what we're going to find. Um, I, do, I can predict that whatever we find in the next couple of years will upend to a certain extent what we thought we knew. And that's, again, the beauty of, of archaeology. It's never old. When we were coming up on the train, you were telling me about when you first went to Megiddo, you had an idea of what you wanted to find. Could you share that with us? <laughs> yeah, it's a bit embarrassing, but okay. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to go to Megiddo, apart from the fact that it was Armageddon, that people had heard of it, was that in my studies, in the late Bronze Age trade studies, I had come across, I mean, in fact, I had read in the original the Amarna archive, right? It was found in the 1880s. Uh, in Egypt, it's a royal archive of uh, Amenhotep III and his son, Akhenaten, the heretic pharaoh, who some of you probably know. And it's um, 360, 70, 380 letters, uh, which are letters in part back and forth between the royal kings at the time, as well as the vassal kings in Canaan. So in that archive, there are six from Megiddo from Biridia, the king or the governor of Megiddo. And I, thinking, and bear in mind this is back in 1994, so forgive me, I was young back then, um, I thought, well, if he wrote six letters, they must have replied to some of them. So there should be an archive at Megiddo, which I'm sure there is. Now, University of Chicago, when they dug there in the 20s and the 30s, had dug away half of the late Bronze Age palace, but the other half is still there. And we know exactly where it is, you can see it, in the side of the bulk. So I wanted to find the archive. That's why I wanted to go. Now, um, I actually had asked to be in that area, and I was all set for when we found the archive because I had brought my Akkadian dictionary with me. <laughs> and I had brought my Akkadian grammar, and I was all set to translate them on the spot. Little did I know, of course, had we found the archive, they would never have let me get close to them. So they would have brought in the experts who actually knew how to conjugate a verb in Akkadian, as opposed to me. All right. So I was young and um, enthusiastic. We never did find the archive, by the way. If anybody's interested, it's still there. I know exactly where it must be, <laughs> but we haven't found it. And that was, that was about 25 years ago, right? Yes, yeah. that was 1994. Right. Yeah. And when you think about just even in that span of time how much archaeology has changed, particularly yeah. with the tools that we have now and how far that, that you had come, even at that point in 1994, from the origins right. of biblical archaeology. Yeah, so just in the 25 years since I started at Megiddo, the, I mean, the basic techniques have not changed. You still dig with a trowel. Right? You still have to use toothbrushes and dental tools if you find a skeleton, things like that. But in the meantime now, we've got remote sensing. Right? We've got ground penetrating radar, we've got electric resistivity, and LIDAR, for example, all the remote sensing techniques. LIDAR, kind of which is a, a form of radar. Right, so light emitting radar, basically, which usually you use from an airplane, and you may have seen they found a whole set of Maya cities underneath the Columbia jungle, and it's been used in Belize and Cambodia. I mean, this is just, wow, this is gonna be, uh, they can map this stuff. Uh, at one of our sites, we used LIDAR, and they were able to map our, our wine cellar in three hours. It would have taken us three weeks to draw it if we had done so. 
So absolutely amazing. But yes, yeah, so just in the 25 years, um, it's really changed. For example, the Megiddo tomb that you may have seen in the news just in the past week or so. Yeah, a royal Canaanite burial untouched. Royal Canaanite burial untouched, yes, which they found in 2016. Of course, I had retired from the project in 2014. <laughs> My timing was wrong, but never mind. But all the pictures are 3D and 3D modeling. Uh, we didn't have that in 1994, but now we've got it, and it's absolutely gorgeous. Mm -hmm. So things have changed. But where they've really changed is since the original explorers, right? I mean, the original, the original guy that came to Megiddo, for example, if we stick with that theme, Edward Robinson, probably the dean of everything way back when, uh, he came with Eli Smith back in the 1800s, and they were looking for all the biblical sites, and they were matching them up with villages, Arabic villages with similar names, which... I mean, they thought they had identified dozens properly, and some of them they did get right. But, for example, he stood on top of the mound at Megiddo, looked out over the Jezreel Valley, and said, where is Megiddo? He knew it was somewhere nearby. He did not realize he was standing right on top of it. I could forgive him for that, except he did the same thing at Jericho and the same thing at Lachish. So, but, you know he didn't realize that it was a man-made mound. He didn't realize that at Megiddo there were between 20 and 30 cities in that mound. So, so we've come a long way since then, since the 1800s. Right, and we, we always used to say that, you know, back in the, in the beginnings, you, you dug with the Bible. People would proudly say they did, dug with the Bible in one hand and a trowel in the other, right? That right. the book informed the purpose. Right. And now you've got papers coming out where people are looking at isotopes in teeth in tiny sites and trying to then go back from there rather than come in from the book to the archaeology, go from the archaeology then. Right. To the book. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so they're looking at strontium isotope. They're looking at ADNA. I mean, this Philistine cemetery outside of Ashkelon is going to be amazing. Ancient DNA, right, where we could, you know, extract, actually be able to extract the DNA from ancient human remains exactly, and the right. genetic fingerprints. So once we do that, we may be able to actually find out where the Philistines do come from, you know, and, and, and where are the sea peoples, which are near and dear to my heart and all that. But yeah, what we're doing in a way, I mean, if we were back in Greece, if we were back in late Bronze Age Greece, I would never be holding Homer in one hand and excavating with the other. Maybe at Troy, but. Uh, perhaps at <laughs> Troy, but not elsewhere. But if the archeology span does match, I'd say, oh, how neat, let look, you know, but even then you don't know if Homer is Bronze Age or Iron Age, but same thing with the Bible. You don't know when it's written down. It's still a matter of debate. Is it, you know, 12th century, 9th century, 8th century, 6th century? So um, I think, so the newer generation is, like I say, kind of putting it to one side and digging and, but you still do have people in the field that are holding it, if not in both hands, at least in their back pocket. Right, right. Um, and in, in some ways then that also, because it informs personal beliefs, it informs politics in some ways too. But yes. our, all our archeology span is identity, yes. right? Yes. And we were talking about archeology span and nationalism, you see this everywhere all over the world. We were talking about Mussolini Right. for instance, in archaeology. And what, what role is Near Eastern biblical archaeology playing in inadvertently in the political world right now? And unwillingly, because very often it becomes a pawn in some sense. Yeah, this is true, especially in, in Israel today. The archaeology is used and abused by modern politicians on both sides. And we are, as you say, frequently pawns. It's not just in Israel, though, as you mentioned. Nationalism and archaeology go hand in hand in virtually every country in the world. Right? There was a conference that was held a couple of years ago on nationalism and archaeology, and they simply said every country in Europe uses archaeology for nationalism, which is true. And so, for example, you just mentioned Mussolini. Most everything you see in Rome right now was excavated by Mussolini because he said, I am a Roman. Right. So I think in Israel, though, you would go back probably to Yadin, Yigal Yadin, uh, digging at um, Hatzor, digging at Masada, digging at Megiddo, and especially when he's there in the 50s and the 60s and then into the 70s. I mean, when he was at Hatzor, he was digging with, not only with Ben-Gurion's uh, permission, but using state labor 
right? The state paid for his dig. Uh, and then when he's at Masada in, you know, 64, 65, I mean, what more could you be but trying to figure out what actually happened back at the end of the first Jewish revolt. But um, there it was trying to tie the brand new state of Israel to biblical roots. And you certainly can't blame them at that time. But, and, but I, would do, I would say in their defense, they're not the only ones that have done it. Yeah, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. I, one, one thing I find very fascinating about the history of um, biblical archaeology, specifically in modern Israel too, is the way that it helped the young state form an identity in the sense where you had whole um, kibbutzes, the go crews going out and volunteering. Like these were not professional archaeologists, but they felt they had a role in uncovering the identity of the state. And, and the beauty of it was it created generations of people who love archaeology and understand it. Right. right. And that's true even today, but not even for nationalistic purposes. It's just a, this is ours, is what I would say. For, so for example, the, uh, the site of Kabri, where I've been also digging, and we alternated years. So Megiddo was even numbered years, Kabri was odd numbered years. So I was always gone, as my wife informs me. Uh, at Kabri, we're on, the, that's the modern kibbutz name, Kibbutz Kabri. And we are digging in an avocado grove. Like literally, it's an avocado grove. And uh, to get in, there's an electronic gate, which you have to call with your cell phone, and then it'll open it up. And so the kibbutzniks think of it as their site. And they come down, and we give them tours, and you know, yeah, it is. It is their site, it's on their land, but it's not just their site, it's their site. So, and uh, at one point we said, you know, thank you in the off seasons for guarding um, your site for us. And they, they looked at us and said, you mean the electronic gate? And we said, yeah, they said, that's not there to protect the site, that's there to protect the avocados. <laughs> 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 you guys are the beneficiaries of that. But it's that, you know, they're, they're proud. They're proud of their site, and, and well, they should be. It's a really, not only is it an interesting site, but now it turns out to have the oldest and largest wine cellar ever found anywhere. So, and one of these days, we will try and recreate the, uh, the wine, if we can. Can you tell us a little bit about this wine cellar? The wine cellar. Um, yeah, actually, I think I have, let me, I'm gonna fast forward here. I think I have a picture for you. Let's see if I can, we can come back to any of these if you want to. I didn't know what you guys are gonna ask in yours. There. There we go. So there's our wine cellar. Looks like Napa. <laughs> it's, it's nice, isn't it? This is my student, Zach Dunseth, whom some of you know. Um, he's very embarrassed by us because it made New York Times, Washington Post, and he says, you put a picture of me twerking on the front page of every <laughs> newspaper. <laughs> so, but this particular one, this was um, unexpected, of course. And in fact, if this guy right there, it's actually not a guy, it's a she. That's Bessie. We found Bessie on the third day of 2013. Totally unexpected. Now this is the Canaanite palace. It dates to 1800 BCE. We, among other things, and this goes back to some of the questions you were asking, we had decided that we wanted to try and investigate the rise of rulership in this area, uh, and f including which is built first, the fortification wall or the palace? Which one do you build first? The wall because you're protecting the palace? or the palace because now you have a wall. But we also wanted to do palatial versus non-palatial, the haves versus the have-nots, right? Try and look at the-, the 1%. Yes, exactly, <laughs> right. So we went to an area that we thought was outside the palace. No, it's the storerooms of the palace. So we found Bessie on like the fourth day of the first week and we were running a field school so I was telling the students, don't just yank this out of the ground you actually have to wait and see what it's resting on. Well, it turned out that Bessie was resting on the floor. But by the time we got down to the floor, she had been joined by 39 of her friends. And so this one room has 40 jars, each of them three feet tall, each of them holding 100 liters. And then the question was, of what? So we took some of the sherds, because um, the jars, you can see they've retained their shape. They're filled with dirt which is why the wine has a bit of an earthy taste now. Right? <laughs> Sorry, I can't resist that joke. But, so the wine is all gone, but the wine, while it was in the jars, had seeped into the ceramics of, of the sides. 
And so now we can do organic residue analysis. So Andrew Coe at Brandeis ran everything through their uh, gas uh, spectrometry ma machine and figured out it's mostly red wine, some white wine, and it is um, flavored with additives like um, mint and juniper berry and uh, lots of honey and also resin to keep it going. So at one point, we, we do want to recreate this if we can, but um, Asafia Sor Landau, my co-director, uh, who's from Haifa, he, at one point he stopped, he started laughing, and he says, you do realize what this is gonna taste like? I'm like, no. He says, well, have you had Greek retsina? I'm like, yeah, sure. He's like, think retsina flavored with cough syrup. I looked at him and just straight faced, I said, that's not going to sell, <laughs> which is true. So we haven't yet recreated this, but I think we will. But this is a good example. This is the last thing we ever expected to find. And if you had asked me as a seven-year-old when I declared to my mother I was going to be an archaeologist, and she had said, you know, oh, that's so sweet, honey, what do you expect to find? I don't think I would ever have said, you know, the oldest and largest wine cellar in the ancient Near East. And yet, there it is. So that's the beauty of archaeology. You really can't predict what you're going to find. Right. It's the questions you pose, and you don't know the answers that are going to come out of it. And speaking of qu questions, since this is supposed to be a very short talk on biblical archaeology, I'm sure the audience has plenty of questions. So if you have questions you want to hand over to Judy, uh, we could start uh, talking about those. And uh, she'll collect those and bring those up, and then we'll run through those. And, um, and so you were also mentioning that there is, so is there a potential that you're going to pu pu make this wine? Maybe, uh, maybe small batches for uh, artisanal dinner parties? We might try and do so. In, in order to do it though, in each of, right, so we now have found three more rooms, right? So that was the first year. And then in 2015, we found three more rooms with another 70 jars. Yeah, so we have about a, almost 120 jars now. Uh, each of them holding 100 liters. So that's the equivalent of about 20,000 bottles in modern terms. So we're not thinking this is a wine cellar anymore. We think this is a small winery. Either that or this is the original party palace. It's <laughs> one of the two. But in each of the rooms, uh, you can actually see there's a hole right there. That's a drain. Each of the rooms has a drain. And in that drain, we found some grape seeds. But we weren't quite prepared to have found them. We, we found them in sifting. But over here, you can see that little white corner there. That's in the next room, and it's right over the drain in that room. So it's still protected. We haven't excavated it. So I want to now go back in our next season, which will be 2019, by the way. If anybody wants to come and dig with us, www.digcovery.com. No, I'm kidding. We don't have that. But <laughs> <laughs> if you do want to come digging, we will do it. But that's one of my aims, is to take out that little triangle go into that drain, be prepared to find more seeds, and then do DNA on that. If we can do the DNA, we can figure out the varietal of grape, and then we can actually redo the wine, which would be kind of neat. Right, and what's so exciting about that too is that so many strains of grape, of wine grape are extinct now. Yes. That you have the potential by recovering these ancient grape seeds to actually potentially do a little Jurassic Park, right, you right. know, with our wine varieties. Right. Exactly, we might be able to. And like, if you've seen Methuselah, the plant that they're growing now, we might be able to do something like that. So we'll see. I don't know. That might be a bit far in the future. But I've been trying to get wineries interested in this. We have some interest, but but we'll see. And of course, the grapes that are there, you know, most of them are brought by the Ross Isles now. So we might have to go fairly far afield in this. But one of these days. So so this now qualifies as the best thing I've ever found, I would say. But before that, let me show you this guy. I, this is my first dig. I was at Talanafa, run by Michigan, way up in the north, in the Hula Valley. I was a sophomore in college, and one morning, uh, I found a petrified monkey's paw. Or at least that's a, what I thought a, I had found. A petrified found. monkey paw. A petrified monkey paw, exactly, yes. Now, I have to put you in context here. First of all, back in those days, and this was 1980, we were digging in the sun, no shades, and we were digging basically wearing almost nothing. I dug with shorts since in the days before we realized about skin cancer and all of that. So it was about 8.30 or 9 in the morning, and I was perilously close to sunstroke, <laughs> and my little digging hammer, my patiche, 
hit something and it flew up in the air. And in slow motion, because I have almost sunstroke, I'm like, ooh, petrified monkey's paw. Because all I saw was something green and spinning. But by the time it landed, I'd come to my senses and I said, silly, there were no monkeys in northern Israel back then, so what could it possibly have been? Well, it turned out it was this guy. It's a little bronze figurine. It's actually the Greek god Pan, the guy with the double flutes and all that. And this would have been at the end of a, um, like this chair. It would have been a wooden chair, but at the end you had these little things in bronze that you could hold on to while you're sitting there. So the, the chair is long gone, it's disintegrated, but that little end piece was still there. So this is uh, from the Hellenistic period, like third century, second century BCE. So we drew this, we photographed it, and then they told me they sent it to Jerusalem. I didn't know, I never saw it for like 30 years mm -hmm. until one day, there it is again, you can see him there. Asaf and I went down to Haifa. We were taking our Kabri finds at the end of the season and he said, I gotta go down in the storeroom. Why don't you go over to our little museum and take a look while you're there. And so I walked into the, uh, the Greco-Roman room and from the doorway I saw a cross. I said, huh, that looks a lot like what I found in 1980 and I got closer and I, that is what I found in 1980. And what you don't see in this picture is a little sign that says on loan from the Israel Museum. And they had brought it up here. So I knew Asaf would not believe me. So that's me and there it is. <laughs> and it was a good thing I took the picture because when we went back the next week, it was gone. They had returned it. So that was the best thing I had ever found, my petrified monkey's paw until I found the wine cellar. So, I mean, who knows what's next? Um, it could be anything or nothing. Bear in mind that that was 1980 with the petrified monkey's paw, not. And then the wine cellar was 2013. That's a long time in between. So whenever people say, you know, well, what have you found? I said, well, we find stuff every season, but most of it's not of interest to anybody except for us. Um, but these, you know, at least the wine cellar made the paper. So we'll see. Anyway, so I don't know. We'll see what happens. And again, you know, 2019, when I go out again, I'll be home writing a book this summer. But 2019, I'm already excited for what we might find. As to what it is, if you were to say to me, what do you, what do you expect to find? I'll be like, got no clue. But it's going to be good. I have no idea. So you need to come with me. That kind of thing. So I'm lucky to be doing something that I love and that I've wanted to do since I was seven. So uh, not everybody is as lucky. Okay, we have plenty of great questions from everybody. So uh, we're going we're gonna to start by throwing a softball at you here. Okay. So what are some of the biggest arguments going on right now in the field of biblical archaeology? Ooh, some of the biggest arguments going on. I think still probably would be, where's the 10th century? I think probably still David and Solomon. Right. So yeah, so the, again, the significance of the 10th century is the, the monarchy. And right. So this goes back, and again, it actually goes to the heart of some of what we were talking about. When Yadin was digging at Hatsor and Megiddo, uh, he thought he had found King Solomon there. And um, now that's been redated by Israel Finkelstein, who basically, in a nutshell, said, Everything that we thought dated to the 10th century BCE and David and Solomon is actually 9th century and is Ahab, Omri, those people. That's being resolved by radiocarbon dating. So you've got Ami Mazar on one hand, Israel Finkelstein on the other. They're now about 30 years apart, which in radiocarbon dating can also be plus or minus. So I think they're getting closer and closer, but we haven't resolved that yet. And that's an internal debate that has external ramifications. Right. Uh, here's another one, um, and this is actually really interesting. Um, Orthodox Jews in archaeology in Israel, do they participate in archaeology? What, how, what, what, how do they fit in to the practice of archaeology in Israel today? Good question. So it depends on what level of Orthodox you mean and if that can be conservative or not. Um, very rarely do you get the ultra-Orthodox, of course, um, though you do get some. Um, lots of people like from bar -Ilan excavate, for example. Um, yeah, I think the closest that we got, there was a local, 
I hesitate to call him a kid, but he was young. He was 14, uh, orthodox, wanted to come excavate with us. And his dad, who had made Aliyah from the States, was okay with that. And in fact, he came and dug with us as well. But I think in all my years, that was the first time I've actually seen somebody um, practicing uh, who was digging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was interesting. Yeah. But he handled it well. It was, uh, fortunately, we didn't find anything that, <laughs> <laughs> we, we had pottery. That was it. So, yeah. Let's see. Oh, here we go. You say that there is doubt that Solomon existed, but is there any doubt or evidence that the first temple was built or that it existed from, from an archaeological perspective? Yeah, okay. So is, yeah, is there any doubt that the first, yes, there's lots of doubt by people in various quarters, shall we say. I mean, in particular, you've got Yasser Arafat, who kept saying that the, the t temple wasn't there. Our people say it's not there. I'm like, who are your people? Right. So the vast majority of the archaeologists would say, yes, of course it was there. The problem is that the Temple Mount's been built and rebuilt and built and rebuilt upon for so long, it's unlikely to find, you're unlikely to find anything. But in the sieving project that was, has been going down in the Wadi Kishon, they're finding stuff from the first temple period that was taken off the mound by the waqf when they built the mosque. So uh, there are still people that claim that it's not there, but I think pretty much every living archaeologist would say, of course, it was there. Right? But this goes back to the use and abuse of archaeology and using it for political purposes. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the most interesting biblical facts about which you have a high degree of confidence, true or false, through archaeology? Hmm. Um, some of the most uh, true or false. I would say it's a combination of archaeology and other things. So for example, um, you've heard of a little thing called the Babylonian exile. Yeah? Okay. So we've got confirmation for that from three or four different sources. Right? So the, the Hebrew Bible tells us about it. But so do the Babylonian chronicles that were kept by the Babylonian priest in the time of Nebuchadnezzar. So this is what, 586 BCE, give or take. So we've got what I would call biblical evidence, we've got extra biblical evidence, uh, and then we've got archeology span where, for example, when they were digging in the old city after 1967, uh, Nachman Avigad was digging and found evidence of a huge battle that had taken place around about 586 BCE, and in the destruction he found two different types of arrowheads, bronze arrowheads and iron arrowheads, and one type was trilobate, it was three-sided. The only people using three-sided arrowheads at that time are the Neo-Babylonians, meaning that what he had just uncovered was the, destruct the conquest destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. And then we've got in the Babylonian Chronicles and elsewhere, we've got the numbers that were taken away. So I would say there's pretty good confirmation that the, the Babylonian exile did take place. And most recently, and this is actually a little disarming, shall we say, there were a number of cuneiform texts that appeared on the market. They were looted from somewhere. But they mention a city in Mesopotamia, somewhere near Babylon, uh, which in translation was called Judah Town. And these are the people that were taken off in the Babylonian exile, as far as we can tell. The big problem is we don't know what site they were found at, which is, oh, I mean, it's terrible. So, but again, that's confirmation that, they, that it did take place. We've also got a ration tablet that says rations for Jehoiachin, king of Judah in Babylon. So we know that that did take place. So there are things that you can find, but often there are little twists. So you, you're wondering, like for example, the um, Tel Dan stele that I mentioned, the one that has Beit David on it, the house of David. They're talking about killing a king of Israel and a king of Judah, and they named them. Uh, the problem is we don't know who actually put up the inscription, but it's thought that it's Hazael of Damascus. Well, if you look in the biblical account, those same two kings are killed, but it says that um, Jehu or Jehu killed them. So how could you have Hazael of Damascus kill these two kings? Or is it Jehu? Or is it Jehu working for Hazael? So it's like, ooh, you almost confirmed it, and then you gave us a little twist. But again, that's the beauty of archaeology and ancient history. Everything, nothing is as simple as it seems. Well, I know you love your sea people. 
I do love my sea people. Maybe give us yes. just a little quick description on who we're talking about when we talk about the sea people. Okay, so the sea peoples, I like them. They're better than the bee peoples and not as good as the D peoples, but. <laughs> All right, so these are people, they are the peoples of the sea. And they were given this name by a French Egyptologist uh, in the 1800s. They're the ones that are responsible, supposedly, for the end of the late Bronze Age. Everything collapses just after 1200 BCE. And it is Ramses III that tells us about it. He's got them on the wall of his um, mortuary temple. He doesn't call them the peoples of the sea. He gives them their own names, the, the Denyan, the Equest, the, the, the and the Peleset, and the Tejeker. The Peleset are probably the Philistines, even Champollion, the guy who deciphered hieroglyphics, he had already said this. So the sea peoples were always blamed for the end of the late Bronze Age when everything came collapsing, collapsing down. Right, and yeah. when we talk about you know the the Peleset, you know, the, as portrayed in the Ramses' Men uh, reliefs at Menet Habu and his funerary uh, reliefs, um, we there is the, the idea that you know they become the Philistines, and we've got a lot of questions here about who were the Philistines, <laughs> where did they come from, the 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 big you know enemy. Yeah. Okay. Right? So this plays into a, a larger picture. Um, first of all, the Bible says the Philistines come from Crete. And so they may well have come from Crete. But the Peleset, if they are the Philistines, are part of nine groups that um, are named both by Ramses and Merneptah earlier. The sea peoples come twice. They come in 1207 and in 1177, um, which is the title of my book that talked about this. The problem for there, and I don't want to go off on a tangent, but um, those dates, 1207, 1177, those are our dates. What they actually say is the fifth year, the eighth year, and that would you know, be better to go by. Um, the problem is we don't know exactly where they come from, and we don't know where they go to. So like one group is the Shardana, and so we play a linguistic game and say, oh, Shardana, that sounds like Sardinia, so maybe they come from there. The Shekelesh, that sounds like Sicily. Maybe they come from there. But it's games. So somebody once asked me, um, if I give you a million dollars, what would you go do? And I said, I would go looking for the origins of the Sea Peoples. I would probably go over to Western Mediterranean and dig there. So trying to figure out where they come from and where they go to would be very, very interesting. But also, I have to say, in their defense, I don't think the Sea Peoples ended the Late Bronze Age. They are part of it, but there's also earthquakes. There's also climate change. There is drought, there are famines. We know this archeologically and textually. So this is part of a much larger picture. Okay. And um, kind of along the same lines for our final question, we've got so many great ones, but we've, you know, it's very short, mm -hmm. right? Oh. Um, the relation between the Canaanites and the ancient Hebrews. What does archeology span tell us about that? The relations between the Ancient Canaanites and the Hebrews, yeah. Um, <laughs> stay tuned. <laughs> we're, we're trying to figure that out. I mean, we're digging a Canaanite palace, which comes to an end at about 1500, so we're trying to figure out what goes from there. But it's also part of the larger question, too. I mean, and if we put this into a broader thing with the Canaanites and the Israelites and all that, and to bring it back to my sea peoples, I actually think that if the exodus is taking place, that this is the time period when it's gonna happen, somewhere around 1250, um, which, which works archeologically, but also when the Sea Peoples come in, they knock off the Canaanites, they're gone. I actually think this is how the Israelites managed to make it into Canaan, because I mean, much as I love my Israelites, I don't think they could have knocked off the Canaanites on their own. But if the sea peoples had come in and if drought and famine had hit and the land is kind of uh, going down anyway, that's a perfect time for the Israelites to come in and settle. Now, maybe they claim to have conquered it when they didn't actually, but people do that all the time. That's history. That's why we need archaeology. Exactly. So this is what I call the coattail hypothesis. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the reasons that I do is, uh, remember I said the sea peoples come in 1207 BCE. Um, and that's the fifth year of Merneptah. That's the exact same year that the famous Israel Steely dates to. 
Uh, it's also called the Merneptostele. It's where the name Israel is mentioned. It's the first time outside the Bible. And in Egyptian, there's a determinative before it, meaning this is a people, not a place. So the fact that Merneptah is mentioning Israel in the same, basically, the same year that he mentions the Sea Peoples, I don't think it's an accident. So I think we have to tie the Exodus into the collapse of the Late Bronze Age. And it, to me, it makes perfect sense because that's then what is going to rise out of the ashes of the destruction of the old world. And then you're going to get Israel and Judah coming out of that. So this is biblical archaeology for me. And that's why it, it lives and continues to live. Well, I think you've given us plenty of food for thought and good discussions around the Seder table coming up this holiday, huh? <laughs> if you thank get you guys <laughs> so much. Really, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Okay. I want to thank both Eric and Kristen. What an interesting talk. Thank you both so much. There will be a reception and a book signing, and I would ask if you all noticed we passed out a piece of paper asking where you heard of this program. So if you would take a moment and just check off where you did hear from this, of this, and then leave your uh, little survey just at the table outside, we would really appreciate knowing that. So I hope to see you at the reception. Thank you.